Hey everybody, this is Colin G. Murphy and welcome to Colin Podcast about Real Estate, show number seven. Today I'm speaking with Reed Goosens, an Australian who moved to the US in 2012 and has since built up a multifamily syndication empire in Austin, Texas with more than 2,000 units. He's also a two-time best-selling author and host of the Investing in the US podcast. Reed's got a hell of a story to tell and I think you're really going to love this show. Before we get to that, I just want to remind you about a couple of things. First, I set up a new website recently called ColinInvestments.com, where you'll be able to find a host of free reports to download that will help you accelerate your real estate journey. You can also find me on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter via Colin Investments, and on Instagram and YouTube with Colin G. Murphy. And finally, if you like this show, if you're enjoying it, please do give it a rating and a review. I'm trying to get the word out to as wide an audience as possible. If you have some friends that might like it, by all means, share it with them. So getting back to my guest today. So Reed Goosens, he quit his job in Australia back in 2011, 2012, moved halfway across the world to chase a goal. He literally arrived in New York City without a job, with no established network, with no family members for support. He literally just backed himself and took a leap of faith. And so with limited funds, very limited funds, just his own money from working his own day job, he purchased his first property, all cash for $38,000 in 2012. And since then he has co-founded Wildhorn Capital and now controls over $250 million worth of commercial real estate. And he's achieved financial freedom in the process. It's a great story. And let's go now and hear what Reed has to say. Reed, how are you doing, man? Welcome to the show. G'day, Colin. Thanks for having me, mate. No, it's, it's been my pleasure. I've been looking forward to getting you on for a while. I've, I love your story. It's got some parallels with my own story, although you've gone on to even bigger and better things. So for people that don't know you, Reed, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your real estate story so far? Sure, yeah. Um, the story is I, just, I moved to the United States back in 2012. Um, I came here really just to be an expat and to get a job in New York City. I chased uh, two loves. The first love was for my then girlfriend, now wife, Erica. She's an American girl. And the second one was to live in New York City for a period of time. I really loved that city when I, was, when I backpacked through it in uh, 2009. And I had the opportunity at the end of 2011. Um, Erica had finished, she came to Australia for a period of time and finished her master's degree. And I was ready for a, a new challenge. Um, and I said, screw it, let's, let's move it. I quit my, I quit my well paying engineering job in Australia. And Moved to New York City. I didn't have a job at all. I literally pounded the streets until I got a job mm -hmm. and I was walking mm -hmm. into different firms. And um, at that point, Colin, I'd already been bitten by the real estate bug. So I think literally with being two weeks fresh off the boat, I was at my first RIA in New York City and I was blown away with how much the access to information that was readily available here in the United States compared to where I come from in Aussie. So yep. yeah, just was sort of hit, hit the ground running a little bit and First, I had to get the job, then had to get the apartment, then had to make sure my relationship was good, and then then get into the yeah. real estate, and then and then you know all those sort of things. And I'm sure you have a very similar story. You know, moving halfway across the world with to, to, to be with someone is it's it's a big leap of faith. And uh, yeah, uh, for me, you know, it's um, eight years later. I, I I'm now running my own business, uh, Wildhorn Capital. We have we have a two thousand units in the portfolio, about a quarter billion assets under ma management. I've achieved financial freedom along the way, and I, I don't say it to boast. I, I say it to you know, if I can do it coming here with visa issues, green card issues, I had limited funds, I knew no one and, and, and give it a crack and give it a go, then, then so can the average American. And I think that's part of what makes ex expats so um, their superpowers, the fact that, you know, the, the failure or the, or the ripcord is literally having to go home. So, yeah. Yeah. No, and, I, and it's funny. There are some parallels there. I came to New York as a 20 year old in the year 2000, you know, worked for a New York life insurance company as an intern, this huge building with 8,000 employees in one building. It just blew my mind coming from <laughs> literally a village in Ireland. <laughs> to that. It was quite a transition, but I was just in love with the whole US dynamic, how, how great a country it was. I was in San Francisco after that at the height of the, the dot boom crisis where you had a bunch of 25 year olds driving around in sports cars making millions overnight and it was just an incredibly exciting time and I you know, fell in love with the US from that and I came over many times for business and then obviously moved over here full time to be in real estate. So I, th I think a lot of expat, expat investors like ourselves, we have like a special appreciation for how unique the US is as a place to do business, you know, not just in real estate, but possibly especially in real estate, because a lot of the things that you might take for granted 
uh, as an American citizen investing here, which might be getting a fixed interest rate for 30 years or getting maybe 10 loans in your own name for rental properties or getting private lenders to lend you money to do your first flip or your first investing or a whole other variety of things. It's just not the norm, is it? You didn't have that stuff in Australia. I certainly didn't have it in England or Ireland or Spain or any other places I lived. No, you, you, you bring up a really good point. And, and I think that it really comes down to the sophistication of the market. It's obviously the, the world's leading GDP. Um, it's, mm -hmm. It has a really large population in comparison to probably where, you, where you're from, where I'm from, right? And, yep. and I always sort of talk about um, on the financing side, just the access to the different financing opportunities. You mentioned a couple there, you know, hard money loans. Um, you, you obviously mentioned the, the incredible uh, underlying uh, mortgage system that they have here, you know, low interest rates for 30 years fixed with Freddie and Fannie. Um, you know, government-backed government agency loans, and that happens in the commercial space as well. And I, I talk a lot about, you know, in, in my field, being in the commercial multifamily, that the we don't even have multifamily in Australia. Like you couldn't, I couldn't go to Australia and buy a 250-unit building of just off the street, right? And the reason we don't have that is because it's a condo market, and probably very similar to Ireland, we we have the lack of the financial sophistication from the lending point of view, where you have a project where you might go and say, okay, I'm going to build 200 units. Well, the lenders are saying, well, you've got to pre-sell 20% of those units before we're going to fund you. So it's, a, it's, it's always a build to sell market, not a build to own market. And that's really why it's, um, you know, for me, it's, it, it's coming to the United States and seeing the multifamily has been really incredible. That's amazing. And, and you, you know, you're running a company now with a quarter of a billion dollars in assets, 2000 plus units across Texas. That's just incredible in pretty short period of time from a guy that came over to the US eight years ago, nine years ago with you know, probably a couple of thousand dollars. Can you talk us a little bit through that journey and the first couple of years and, and when it really took off and how, who you partnered with, how, how it happened? Yeah, yeah. So look, the first, I, I, I just quickly rewind, like back sure. when I, I, I finished uni in 07, went abroad to actually Europe and, and, and London, was in London for a period of time in 2008 and then in 2009 I was in the South of France and that's where I bumped into Erica and I worked for a period of time in the super yachts. And then in 2010, when I came back to Australia after being gone for a couple of years and I was back in my engineering job and that's when I stumbled upon the book, on the, upon the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, you know, and, and, and sure. this whole concept of being an entrepreneur, I had no idea what it was. It's obviously a sexy name for a small business owner, but, you know, really trying to had the taste of living my own life and being a backpacking around the world and packing my life up into one bag and wanting mm -hmm. that freedom again, but not knowing how someone could pay me to live my life. So um, I, I, for me, it was under, trying to understand what entrepreneurship meant, what it meant from a um, going out and, and getting a residual income, uh, sorry, no, no, a passive income from investments. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for me, it was just a putting two and two together, being a structural engineer, having a background working in buildings, real estate was a natural path for me. So that book really opened my eyes. And so when I moved to the United States, it was sort of like I'd already been sort of self-educating in Australia and I was going to do something in Aussie, you know, fl flipping a house or doing a lease option or whatever it was. Um, but yep. then I made the decision to move to the United States. And so I still had the bug when I moved here. I just didn't realize the barriers to entry in this market was so much lower. Now, I don't talk about New York, San Francisco or Chicago or LA. I'm talking about the secondary and tertiary markets where mm -hmm. they just don't exist in Australia, right? We, we have a very um, high demand, low supply environment because our population is very low compared to the United States. And, and here in the, United, in the US, you have the same land mass as Aussie, but you can only, in Australia, we can only inhabit 20% of our land because the rest is desert. Where here in the United States, you have north, south, east, west, you have 350 million people that need somewhere to live. And so this spurs all these secondary and tertiary markets. And I found some markets within four hours driving distance from New York City that I could buy a property, a triplex for less than $40,000. And I was blown away. Wow. And, you know, as a, as a bright eyed, bushy tailed Australian, not having any idea what Section 8 housing was or what the ghetto was, I, I went I went in there and, and bought a couple. And, and that's really what I got started doing. And, and for me, when I first moved here, I, no one was lending to me because I was fresh off the boat. So I, I bought my first property with being six months, uh, you know, at the end, by the end of 2012, when I moved to the US, I had my first property uh, purchased and I bought that all cash because I'd saved some money you know, in, a, in my career and, and I could buy it for 38,000 bucks and I put, I think, 10 or 12 grand into it. And, um, and on paper, it looked great. It was a 13 cap. Um, nice. But then in reality, it, it, it sort of didn't work as, as great as that, but it was, it was a good start to get me off to the races because the, the biggest thing that I've, you know, I can tell your audience is that 
you don't get to deal number 10 without doing that first deal. And for no. me, I had the, I, I knew I needed to get that first deal done. I knew I needed to be my own operator. And did you and do I, it all yourself? Did you partner with anybody? No, or were you I, I, just I going in guns myself. blazing? Well, it wasn't guns blazing per se, because remember when I moved to the US, I started attending these rear events. And again, this whole fire hose of information coming at me, this whole yep. access to um, information that was readily available at my fingertips at these local meetups, I was blown. I was like, this is bloody brilliant, you know? And, and I got to meet some people and people talking to me about the cash flow. And this is okay, well, cash flow is what I want because that's what Kawasaki talks about. Okay, well, where do we find it? You know, and okay, well, where can I get to? I didn't have a car when I lived in New York City. I could get on a Greyhound bus and drive four hours north and I could get up there in one Saturday and get back and still be at the pub having a few drinks with the boys uh, <laughs> by, the, by, 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 by seven o'clock on Saturday night. So it just, it was a, it enabled me to start getting my get my, my feet wet. And, and I definitely was at a stage coming middle of 2012 that I knew I needed something more to give than just um, reading my nose stuck in a book. I, I needed to be uh, more, I just needed to jump in the deep end because there was only so much analysis paralysis I could do before you know, I just need to get started. Like, it's like that old saying, you know, you don't read about going to the gym and losing weight. You got to open the door and get on the bloody treadmill. So that's what I did. You do. And real estate is a journey and you don't get there unless you take action, take action, learn from your mistakes and, uh, and keep going. And you're right. If you, if you lost $5,000 on that first deal, it would have been a real pain in the ass, but you'd have dusted yourself down and, and keep going to the race and figure out. And if you make $5,000, great all the better but either way you, you learn a lot and you learn enough to do the second deal and the third deal i didn't make much money my first deals either you know worked our asses off myself and my, my business partners you know david and Catherine, and we're you know you're barely breaking even sometimes but you learn a lot you figure out what you did wrong and you correct it and then suddenly you're not working so hard and making even more money and that's that's the beauty of real estate yeah and it, it, it's but it also allows you to like for me, I learned from a very good friend of mine. Uh, it's not about the money you make on the first deal. It's because everyone, everyone who gets involved in real estate wants to make a lot of money on the first deal to prove that it works. But mm. the reality is that most people don't make a lot of money on their first deal. And, and m myself included, I, I, I broke even. I had a, had a drive-by shooting at that first property. Um, yeah. I learned the, the power, the, the Section 8 housing. I, I under, you know, the reason those properties were $38,000 were, were for a reason. It weren't ever appreciating. But I got... I got going right and yep. it wasn't about the it wasn't about the money i made on that first deal it was my own money i was willing to risk it it's the fact that i got my foot in the door and it got me off to the races and so that was and it was it was lessons that i invaluable lessons that i could take on and the ability to tell my give myself permission that i could do this right rather than just being you know being mentored to do it and not actually ever never taking any action yeah. So did you do a lot of flips the first couple of years or did you go straight from one or two flips into partnering with people to do syndications? How, how did yeah, that transition so, work? So that, that was yeah, good, good segue. So bought my first property triplex, 38,000 bucks, uh, finally got a line of credit, got, bought a second one. Mm -hmm. Actually then, and it was, well, these were all to hold because they were making me a little bit of cash flow each month. Um, and then I was still working full time as a structural engineer in New York City. In two, and then in early 2014, I went to, I, I bought a property in Philadelphia with a partner and actually brought my dad on with some, my first outside investor to, do, to actually flip a property, a, a row house uh, in, in Philly. That didn't go very well. Um, but again, it was, it was something I learned and, and learned along the way. And at that point in time, I then made the decision to move to, to LA because my, my wife is from here. Okay. Um, but also... I had a conversation with a very good friend of mine from, from Canada um, at the time and I was sort of boasting to him about how I, uh, I was I had this small little portfolio of properties and, um, you know, I think I maybe seven units at the time, you know, between some flips and some, you know, actual try and buy and holds. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was, he, you know, pat me on the back, said, well done, but uh, I, I just bought a 70 unit deal. And I said, how the hell do you afford 70 units? Right. And this is in Canada. And he told me about the power of OPM and he told me about that he got a seller carrack finance and he told me about he had a mentor and that he raised some money from some friends and family who were able to get, you know, for $500,000, they got a deposit and they were able to buy a $2 million property. Um, and he was applying the same philosophies that I was doing in my small triplexes and duplexes, which was going in, improve, you know, renovating the unit, putting new appliances in and increasing the, the rent 100 to $200 a month. 
except he was doing it on scale. And so the same philosophy is applied from my smaller stuff, but he was doing it on, on just, uh, just a different level. And so, yeah. but the big thing for me was that was when the mentor needed to come in into play. And I, I'd been putting that off for so long because I wanted to sort of do it myself, right? But it was a now, I knew I was getting to the end of my rope um, and my ceiling and I, I needed to, you know, go out and pay for a mentor and I found one. Uh, someone who I want, aspired to be, and they'd only done one major big multifamily syndication, um, but it was someone that uh, that I could afford, and that you know allowed me to part ways with some money and say, hey, I'm going to take myself seriously, and this is me investing in myself. So was this so, somebody you met in LA, a more experienced no, investor that you paid money to go through your deals and walk you through? How, no, how did actually, that work? It actually was a, a gentleman in New York City, um, but prior to me leaving and through okay. going through his program, I developed my own, you know, my focusing on investor databases um, and trying to trying to build my own investor database through um, my, my starting a podcast and talking about my story. And mm -hmm. through that, I was able to partner with him on a few different deals. And I actually introduced him to his business partner when I came to LA because I, I met, uh, I became good friends with a guy who was also hustling like I was and he found a great deal and he didn't know how to raise the money. And I said, well, I'm working with his mentor. Maybe he can raise you the money. And he didn't want to raise it at the time, but I sort of pushed them both and they went off and got a deal done. And that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I partnered with them on a few different deals um, over the years as I still continued to, to grow my network. And I made the strategic move at that stage, Colin, when I moved to LA, um, to, to move out of engineering and actually moved into real estate development full time, I said to myself, if I have to be in this country, or if I have to continue working before I was able to be financially free, why not surround myself 24 seven with the business? And so I was working for a, a small engineering firm in LA for a period of six months. And I reached mm -hmm. out to a bunch of developers here and mm -hmm. through just one random email, the guy liked my story and I, all of a sudden I was building high end like, Tree multifamily uh, apartments in um, in Long Beach, and and I had a skill set being a structural engineer coming with you know that that institutional project management experience, yeah. Um, and I brought that to the to the real estate development world, and and I got to see the behind the scenes of how a, how a big, probably billion dollar company is run, um, wow. and that for me was and again the guy the, the owner of that company was also an expat from an Iranian guy who, who moved out here in the 70s, and you know made it happen. So. Again, expats everywhere I go in my life. The New York, uh, the, the the guy in New York who I worked for as a structural engineer, um, uh, a Russian Jewish fella who who came out and started a, a structural engineering firm. The guy who the structural engineering joined I worked for in LA. He was an Egyptian guy, came out here, started a structural engineering firm. So nearly everyone I've been employed by in this country has all been expats. And Interesting. back to just giving it a go and giving it a crack and making the most of it. it, it those types of people, along with my mentors at the time, Mm -hmm. Help me, you know, try and realize where I needed to go. So yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And and hopefully you're are you giving back and are you helping young expats coming over now as well? If you got a couple of twenty year olds, twenty four year olds running around the place and learning the ropes. Uh, not you. yet. Not yet. Not yet. It's uh, when you're trying to run a, a you know two thousand units. It's uh, you get <laughs> you don't have a lot of time for teaching these days. But uh, I'd like True. to give back more. I do it through the podcast, obviously that I have. Mm. But um. It, 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 yeah, something I I, dab, I dabbled in a little bit when I was, I was getting going to make a little bit of a side income, um, but not not as much, uh, not not from a professional point of view yet. So yeah, fair enough. Well, these two thousand units, tell us a little bit about them. I mean, what what types of properties have you bought? How did you find them? How did you you know raise the money to buy them? Yeah, so um, we, I, we use my business partner and I. We use the, the the vehicle of real estate syndication. And for those people who don't know what real estate syndication is, think of it like uh, if I Reed Goosens was to go hire a Boeing seven four seven to get from LA to Tampa, it would cost mm -hmm. me a lot of bloody money. But if I if I shared the cost with two hundred passengers, we can all enjoy the journey from point A to point B. And, and in the analogy of a plane, like my business partner and I. We're the captain and co-pilot. We have people in first class who might be the general partnership and everyone in coach is, you know, the limited partners and they bring capital to the table and they get to enjoy the in-flight entertainment um, and not have to pay the exorbitant amount of money to buy the entire plane, but just to sort of rent it and get on board and enjoy the journey. And so for us, that's what that's the vehicle we've used to this point. Um, we we raise money, you know, fifty to $100,000 at a time uh, mm -hmm. through friends, family, uh, investor networks that we've created over the years. Um, but as wow. we grow, you know, we know we're going to slowly pivot to go more private institutional capital route because 
you get to a point where your your network is only so is limited you can only grow so quickly and um yeah. the more deals you do the quicker you want to do them um the the more you prove to brokers that you can close on deals that all of a sudden deals start coming out of the woodwork so you don't have enough money to to, to go and close on all these deals so that's how we've grown the business in the last four or five years and um we're really excited it's just my it's my business partner and i uh to this point we've got a couple of uh, virtual assistants but also an executive assistant and we're looking to go double the portfolio in the next two to three years and we know we've got to bring on you know full-time asset managers full-time underwriters um and and that's what we'll go off and, and build here in the, the next little while which is pretty exciting to, to be honest well it sounds like you, you've you've got fantastic ways of of telling your story to investors and raising money for investors but they're only going to participate if you have a great deal so how do you find these these deals how do you find these on undervalued yeah. assets and, and and make them better so that's where my business partner comes in so up until before meeting uh, andrew campbell um he's, he's he and i both founded wild horn capital um i was underwriting deals from la in dallas texas right and and um I was missing out on these sort of on these 50 or 30 unit deals by you know, 20 or 30,000 bucks on a couple million mm. dollar deals. And this yeah. is going back a couple of years. And, and mm -hmm. what I realized is that I didn't have that partner who was boots on the ground. And so I bring sort of a, a skill set to the table that is complementary to my business partner, Andrew. He, he is not detailed oriented like I am, given my structural engineering background, mm -hmm. um, but also not system oriented like I am in terms of building out underwriters, building out my systems, building out, making sure we're, we're underwriting correctly. And so the analogy I sort of always say is that Andrew shakes lemon tree. I determine if we make lemonade or lemon juice out of it. Um, so he's boots on the ground. He, he's, he's, he's finding the deals. He's got those broker relationships. And, and I can focus more on the systems and, and the operations to make sure that everything's going smoothly. And it's really important when you're growing and scaling a business to find a complementary partner who, compl who can complement your skill set in order to take some roles and responsibilities off my plate. Yeah. because I didn't have that skill set at the time. And now we've built, gone and built it out. And, and to my point, I said earlier, you know, once you close on a couple, you start getting a track record and you, people start knowing that you can close. And so then more deals start coming to it a lot easier. Now we still got to underwrite a lot of deals to find the best ones. But in saying that, we're also now getting a reputation for ourselves in our markets to, to be closers, to be good operators, to be good guys to work with. And that's really the legacy we want to lead uh, as we develop this company. No, that was fantastic. So tell me, I mean, it's not a natural progression from being a structural engineer in a big firm to being underwriting complicated financial documents for an apartment complex. I mean, how did you develop those those skills to, to do what you do to make sure the investor's well, money is being managed to make sure the you know, you know what the operating income is to make sure you know what money is being set aside for repairs and maintenance and capex. I mean, how, how did you learn those skills? So, well, two things is being a structural engineer, I, my, my former life was building very complicated sheer stress models in Excel. So once you know how to build a couple of macros, building a cash flow model is actually the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> so it wasn't, and I don't say that to joke, but it was more to do with the fact that I was quite proficient at Excel. Or I am quite proficient at Excel to a point. Mm -hmm. um, yep. and, and at the end of the day, you know, I was very good with, 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 with numbers, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not determining the stress quotient of a shear wall in a 50 star, 50 story tower. It is understanding how, what's the income, what's the expenses, what's my NOI, what's my cash flow. So actually it's a lot simpler than people make it out to be. Now, as you go, as you grow and you learn, you go and do more deals. That's the beauty of the more you underwrite, the more you understand. And that's the mm -hmm. not the necessarily the sexy part of underwriting or, or, or building a business, but it's doing it, you know, 50, 100 times, 200 times in a market to understand what a 1980s building will cost you to run or what the property management will cost you in that area or what the insurance might cost you. Um, and over time, as you do more and more deals, you underwrite more and more deals, you, you, you make sure you're logging that data so when you come to underwrite the next one, it's slightly easier because you can use data from previous deals. And that is all, that's all it is. And so I, I don't want to simplify it, sound like it's simple. It is and it isn't, but you've got to also make sure you're breaking it down into its components, which is yep. income, expenses, uh, and, and cash flow and debt, debt services. If you can plug in decent information from good advisors or, or you've just done a lot of underwriting, then you slowly get to understand 
what things cost. And like back in my day when I was a structural engineer and working for the developer in Long Beach, I got to understand how they underwrote deals. And so I could see behind the curtains about how a cash flow model works. So I did bring skill sets from both engineering, my time spent at, at Ensemble Real Estate Investments as working as an owner's rep uh, for nearly four years into my business and collate, collating skill sets along the way and using them to then go and you know, make the fundamentals of what my business will then grow from. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's, yeah. that's a perfect. That's, thanks for that answer. And, and you're right. A lot of this is just down to doing it again and again and again and refining it and just spending, putting in the hours, underwriting, putting in the hours, analyzing. And that goes for anybody listening that if you're thinking of buying your first couple of rentals, you need to start practicing underwriting deals, underwrite a couple of deals every day, start tweaking your spreadsheet, start underwriting deals that you might not even have, have any intention of buying any, any more than you, you probably started practicing underwriting numbers and some syndicated deals back in the day that, that you might oh. not have been buying, but you, you need to learn how to do it. You need to learn how to build out those tools so that yeah. you can, when you're using live ammunition, you've, you've got some practice behind you, you know? Well, Colin, I'll say that the first deal, the first major deal that I, I took down, Andrew and I, we took down by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We underwrote 60 or 70 deals before we found it. Um, you know, so it was a lot of data and that was in one MSA. So it was a lot of yeah. data to go through. Um, and, and so we always try to use, you know, the rule of thumb is like you underwrite 50, you like 10, you offer on five, you might get accepted on one. You know, like that's, that's the sort of, as you're starting, because those people listening, and that it can apply to not just multifamily, but it can apply to single family houses. Go out and underwrite 50 properties. And you, you know, you're gonna find that the five or 10 that you like, you're gonna offer on three or four of them. You may not get any of them, right? But you, yep. you start to just go through the numbers and that's, it's not sexy, but you have to do it. You do have to do it. And sometimes you might go weeks getting none of them. And in other times you might put in a bit of work on a Monday morning and you get two, but <laughs> exactly. you wouldn't have got those two if you didn't do all the other stuff before it. So listen, talk, talk to us briefly about how you see the, you know, picture you're, you're an investor with a few hundred thousand dollars. What do you see as the pros and cons of building your own portfolio of rentals, which might be a few single family homes, a couple of you know duplex, triplex versus participating passively in, uh, you know, Texas, you know, multifamily syndication like you run? Look, I think at the end of the day, you've got to answer one fundamental question is, and do you want to be an operator or do you want to be a passive investor? Do you like the current day job you're in and you just want to place your excess cash in, in a deal and, and, and you know, be a sort of nest egg for the next 20 or 30 years? Or do you want to break out of your current career and, and, and be a full-time real estate investor? And whatever you answer that question is, is going to ultimately point you down the path of what you need to then do. Um, if it's if it's the latter, you want to be a full-time real estate investor and you're jaded with your job, which is what I was, and that's how I can relate, mm -hmm. then yeah, you're going to start with things that you can chew, right? And that might be a single family property like I did. I started with a $38,000 property, but I built it over time. I built the confidence to go and do bigger and better deals. So if you had a couple hundred thousand dollars and you want to be your own time invest, uh, your own investor, maybe you can put 25 grand into a syndication and see how it goes, but maybe you can spend the rest of it buying your first fix and flip or buying a couple of rental properties so you can see what it's like to uh, run your own deals. And I always say for people who are trying to become a full-time real estate investor and want to get into the syndication space mm -hmm. is that you've got to do a couple of runs on the board with your own money before you can go and start asking other people for money. Don't yeah. ever think you can go do one deal, your first ever deal, first ever fix and flip, or your first ever small rental and think you can bring on outside capital because things can go wrong. And, and like I've had in my experience, like you've had in your experience, Colin, they don't all go according to plan. And you have to be willing to understand that. And, and, and like my first fix and flip deal in Philadelphia didn't go to plan at all. And I had my dad invested in it. I had to dip into my own pocket. I didn't lose my shirt, but I didn't make any money because I made sure my dad was one whole, but two, I gave him a return on investment. And that's the responsibility of a syndicator is knowing that when things go bad, you can dip into your own pocket. Now you can't do that when you're going straight and doing your first deal. So that's where you got to get a, a confidence and a few little runs on the board um, to, to, to go off and then start asking people for, for, for money because that's what people are going to ask you for. They're also going to say, hey, how many deals have you done? Have you ever done this before? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, why would I trust you with my money? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yep. No, we, we were, we were lucky enough to have money when we started doing flipping properly. We, we had some money. So we did our first five, six flips just with our own cash. And after that, we Perfect. owned some rentals, you know, free and clear. And we 
put some you know mortgage short-term mortgages on on that to fund the next 10 or 15 and mm -hmm. after we've done that then we started taking private money you know that right. we could show people well we've done 20 deals and we want to do another 20 do you want to jump in i mean there's a big difference between you know be very careful before you go into your your, your dad or your uncle or your cousins asking them for 20 or 50 or eighty thousand dollars to try something right. new be very careful about that um, right. yes you yes. can get away with it but if you don't it's uh, not pretty <laughs> so, 100 percent. so let's let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room i mean you've you've clearly rode a fantastic wave uh the last you know seven eight years it, it's it's been one of the best times to invest in real estate you know in, in living memory and, and certainly even in, in texas has been unbelievable in the last six years i mean you've you've really picked fantastic markets and your timing was impeccable and the asset class you picked was 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 fantastic as well so you've you've rode a hell of a wave and you've got it super high but w w what's going to happen with that next a lot of people are understandably worried about the impact COVID 19 and and the recession is going to have on real estate because real estate's a bit of a lagging indicator it hasn't gone down yet it's it's prices are still high thanks to low interest rates thanks to tight supply thanks to government money i mean you can keep going on you've done much deeper analysis of, of this than i have how are you communicating to your investors what's your take on what the future holds for for residential real estate and, and the types of real estate you do in particular yeah so i think the first thing we've got to look at is the we're still we ain't out of, we ain't out of the woods we're, we're very close to the sun still in terms of where we are with covid yeah um we just closed on q2 uh i've sent out all my investor updates and the the, the headline is by and large, multifamily has done very, very well uh, mm -hmm. as a commercial asset class uh, in terms of collections. Uh, there's, and, and I'll get into the, the nuances of what is going well and what isn't going well because everything is being affected. Um, but if when you compare multifamily to other commercial asset classes like um, uh, retail or office or hospitality, it's looking pretty attractive right now. And the, yeah. the reason it's looking attractive is because of human needs, right? We need to feed ourselves and we need shelter. And multifamily provides that. Now, and, that, and so for, for that, in that being said, we I believe we will see a bigger flight of capital to regional centers like Texas and Austin, Texas in particular is where we're really invested. Uh, and we've heard from brokers that even now they're seeing big institutional coastal players start looking at markets like Austin um, in terms of feasible that they've never even looked in the past, but in terms of feasible, um, they want to buy multifamily there. So we're already seeing competition increase. Um, and I think in the long term, if interest rates remain low, so will cap rates. And, and with the increased interest in the market or in the, in the space, you go, prices will remain low. That's one side of the coin, and and, and I think that I, I wholeheartedly believe that once we get out of the fire, you know, once we we have a vaccine, once we sort of get back to normalcy, um, mm -hmm. the other thing I will say is being an expat is this ain't an American problem, right? The COVID nineteen is not an American problem. Rent is due in Ireland, in Australia, in America, in Mexico, in Canada, and everyone and how we deal with it from all the way from the top of the government, I want to get, I don't want to get political, but all the way down to the grassroots and where you're invested and what MSAs are invested is, we're all going to be at the start line together, hopefully. And how we get out, how do each MSA gets out of the start line, you know, from uh, opening restaurants to bringing back live entertainment to bringing back sporting games, that is all going to have a huge impact on consumer sentiment, which is, which is what the GDP here in America is, which is what the GDP of most Western countries is made up of is yeah. consuming stuff. So when people can start feeling confident that they are not going to be get catch COVID um, walking around the streets, uh, it will we, you know, how, how your city reacts is going to really depend on how well, well or well not your, your asset class reacts. With that being said, there are some nuances within our portfolio that we've been seeing. And the longer this goes on for the longer it will hurt today. And, and, and the, the short-term future is what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking two years' time from now when the vaccine is, is in place and we still have probably low interest rate environment, mm -hmm. multifamily is, is going to be just be fine. Yep. I think um, back to sort of the, the pandemic at itself and the, the uncertainty around it, we've, we've got a couple of assets in our portfolio who are actually increased revenue this, this, this quarter than they did in quarter one. Wow. We've got some other assets that are really hurting. And the reason that they're hurting is because of the demographic 
then when I say herding, it's all relative, right? They're, they're still collecting not plus 95% of their collections. They're, they're still occupied at 91% um, or not above 90%, but they have dropped a little bit. But the real thing that we're noticing is when have you picked up that asset and when is the value add plan of turning the rent roll? Where are you in that process? Because part of what we do on any asset we, we buy is we like to turn the rent roll. COVID hit, you know, have you been caught with your pants down? You know, meaning are your tenants or your tenant demographic, is there a large portion of that rented demographic that is on an hourly or in the service-based industry where they can't afford to maybe make the rent or they're getting skittish about making the rent? And that has been the biggest thing that I've seen across our portfolio of 2000 units. We've probably seen less than 2% of people skip or you know, canning keys or whatever. Great. But the thing is we've also seen, which is kind of interesting, that people are still moving. Um, our renewal rate every month in the last quarter didn't actually really go up to 70 or 80%. We thought that people would want to stay in the same place or whatever. We actually saw relatively same numbers compared to Q1 and even Q4 of last year, where it's about 40 to 50% of every month when a, 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 an up, um, a lease comes up to renew, 40 to 50% of the tenants will just move on, you know, continue living their lives. So when you when you see, say, you know, say you have a month where 10 leases come up for renewal and five of them move out, but yet we're in the shelter in place and we don't have the same traffic coming through to replace those five, that's when occupancy starts to dip. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been seeing has been a bit of an issue trying to manage that right here, right now, month on month. So overall, it really depends on one, what type of asset class you're invested in. I think if you're investing in very low socioeconomic areas, blue collar workers, you're probably gonna be more affected than if you're investing in the white collar workers areas where you, people can work from home and they're more right. tech savvy. And we've got a mixture of both in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, two, also the lack of traffic has been a real indicator for some assets and some demographics of like having to flip to a, uh, a virtual leasing. And that's been a real quick pivot, right? We have to do it very quickly at the end of, at the end of March. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing for us is making sure that we as a landlord see people as humans, right? This, our bit, we're in the business of making sure people come first. We, we're in the business of providing shelter we're, and we need to make sure that our communication to our tenants is that we're here for you. And we're gonna try and work with you as best we can to keep you in, in, your, in your home because you, the fact that you lost your job isn't your fault. It's the fact that there's a COVID pandemic out there. And again, goes back to the global perspective mm -hmm. um, that this is affecting across the, the world. It isn't just the United States. Now, I think from an unemployment point of view, we need to be very cautious of that. And that I think will be the, the, the tail of this um, recession that I think it won't, we won't bounce back. Um, and, and given that we're coming into some second waves in both California and Texas and now in Florida, yep. will prolong the pain. How the government reacts to that and how jobs react to that is gonna be very interesting to see. So right now when I'm in the fire, I can only use the data that I've collected. We, and, and month on month, we'd be getting better in Q2. So April was the worst, then May got a little bit better, then June got even better and hopefully it will continue. But the second wave, I've got no idea what's gonna happen, right? And using data as best I can to foresee stuff. Right now, I think the longer it go, drags on for the longer we're gonna you know, potentially be in quote unquote pain. And when I say pain, it's all relative. It's better than other asset classes are doing. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope does that answer your question? It's, <laughs> it's, a little it's, 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 it's no, it's a very interesting answer. And, and if, if it's the case, and it, it certainly makes sense that, um, you know, assets with a high percentage of blue collar clients that can't work remotely as easier as maybe higher end kind of B plus A class units, you know, that have been less affected, the, the people living in those areas, their income has been less affected. Does does that mean that the the kind of lower end communities, the, the C class, D class, do you see prices maybe changing on those a little bit quicker, whereas there might be more demand from those big big pocketed guys coming out of the major cities into tertiary cities and secondary cities? Will they be targeting the A class in your cities now and, and making it more difficult for you to get the asset class that, that is going to provide the most stable income? Well, I, I think the short answer is yes, 100%. I think you're going to see, um, uh, you know, if, if you really got to look at like what the, del um, not delinquencies, but um, uh, loan forgiveness is, or loan forbearance, I should say. I know when Freddie mm -hmm. and Fanny brought that out. If you're asking for loan forbearance in month of April, like you're really up the creek. We've not, we've not even need to look at loan forbearance and we've easily been able to cover our debts and our expenses. Um, cash flow has been a little bit tight and we've had to pause distributions, but 
hey, we're in a really unprecedented yeah, it's, time it's and it's affecting the yeah. world, right? So that's the worst thing that's going to happen. It will ding the IRR on the overall investment in in four or five years time, but that's this is the market, right? We you you have to be communicating with your tenants. You've got to be communicating with your investors. You've got to be communicating with your bank all the time and making sure everyone is abreast of all the issues that is going on. Uh, and, and we need to leave with those tenants first because our business is providing shelter for people, housing, and, and, those are the, and those are the big things that we as owners need to make sure that this period of time, given the uncertainty that we are leading with that people first mentality, because I think it's super important. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And so with that in mind, you, you kind of have two hats on. On one, you, you have your immediate problems, you have fires to put out, you have a lot of families that you want to try and help and you want to keep them safe. But on the other hand, you, you need to you, you have investors, you have business partners, you need to plan for the future. So Correct. given the you know uncertainty ahead of us, which also creates opportunities, wh- what would you where would you like to see yourself in, in the next one year, two years, three years? Because you're, you're used to growing at a pretty good trajectory. How do you see the next three or four years going for you? Expanding well, out of Texas? Are you consolidating? What, what do you what do you say? No, well, I think we're, for, for us, we're, we're definitely going to be um, uh, we're, we're, we're doubling down in, in a place like Austin, Texas. It is definitely growing very quickly. Mm-hmm. We may um, we're pivoting to look at slightly other different types of um, multifamily, we'll call it sectors. Um, so we've just, we're about to close on a brand new um, uh, opportunity zone deal. Uh, it's nice. a more of a longer term play. Um, now it's got very low cash flow, but it's, you know, the fact that you can have capital gains dollars deferred and then get off the hamster wheel of the 1031 exchange in 10 years time is really attractive to investors. We're also looking at potentially doing some hotel conversions uh, to multifamily, low um low end uh, multifamily so we can get tax subsidies from the local government. And really we want to be really uh, sort of an inch mile wide and a mile deep in, in one area. Um, we don't ever have the goal to go and become 15, 20,000 units. We, we, we really, we're, we, if we get to 5,000 units and you know, we buy four deals a year and sell four deals a year, that's a good sustainable growth, we yeah. believe. Um, and for us, that's, that's, we don't aspire to be any more than that. And so, we can easily do that in Austin, Texas, in the central Texas markets. We can pivot it to a dip, some slightly different, we'll call them asset classes within the multifamily space. Um, but we're still underwriting deals today. We're, we're looking at new partners. Uh, we're talk, I spoke to you about the private equity earlier. That, that's the sort of pivot we'll be making, excuse me, in the next little while as bigger companies start to look at us to want to see who's active in the, in the local market. Well, that's us at Wildhorn Capital. So we're going to really capitalize on that and just continue doing what we do um, and, and you know, try and underwrite as much as we can and see all the opportunities that hit the market um, when they do and making sure we're seeing them at the right time so we can preempt the market and, and try and get some you know, good cracking deals, as I like to say, uh, before the rest of the market does. <laughs> I love that insight you just gave about converting hotels into multifamily because, like you say, if there's going to be an asset classes where discounts might be available in the next six, nine months, you know, hotels is, is going to be up there. I think that's an amazing idea. Right. Are you... Are you, are you kind of building a war chest for that? Are you thinking about building a war chest uh, for that so you can take advantage of those opportunities? We've we've underwritten a handful of deals in the local market and some 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 sub markets which are better suited for multifamily than they are for hotels. And looking at those extended stay type of hotels where they have the plumbing already in the walls for for the small kitchenettes, um, but really making sure the that we, we're getting the 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 planning right where we can go and convert it quite easily and get the tax incentives for offering low income housing product to the low income housing community of, of Austin. Um, and so there's a few sort of moving pieces of that. It's obviously not just easy. Oh, I was going to go do it and buy it and convert it. And all of a sudden it's about the tax incentive piece. It's obviously about making sure we qualify to for the affordable housing piece as well. Um, and and we're, we're buying them at the right price. Right. So, um, all those things go into we're looking at right now we haven't actively made any offers yet but we think by the end of the year early q1 that we'll have probably one or two or even three under under our belt um as as we move forward so yeah that's fantastic so yeah exciting times ahead for you reach that's really interesting i appreciate those insights so how let's let's say a couple of things how could investors get in touch with you if they might want to learn more about their syndications and then how about other people i know you have a very popular podcast that that teaches people about real estate investing tell us a little bit about your your company how people can get in touch with you and and your podcast yeah look the easiest way is just to jump onto reedgoosens.com that's r-e-e-d-g-o-o-s-s-e-n-s.com you can see the books up there got a couple of best-selling books you can see the podcast you can read the blog you can get in, in touch with me and then I can you know, get you on the, on the email distribution list for our, all our deals. 
Um, so that's probably the easiest way. Um, the other thing I offer to people, if, if they're ever coming through LA when they get back on a plane and they want to meet up for a beer or a coffee and talk shop, you can always shoot me an email. Just give me a little bit of heads up, but um, shoot me an email at info. That's I-N-F-O at reedgoosens.com. That's, that's a nice offer. I'd like to take you up that on myself next time I'm passing through LA, mate. Definitely. Definitely. So, any give me some fi- final thought for you know some people out there that that might be sitting on some cash, but they're just generally nervous and and worried about whether to just sit on it or do something with it or wait until next year. What's what's your advice for people that let's say they're in my, a steady my, my job but they have advice, money? Yeah, my best advice is is something my dad always used to tell me back in the day: is a fool and their money are easily parted. So, if you are nervous about it right now, and you want to sit on the, the sidelines. Don't sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Sit on the sidelines and become educated about what you want to invest in, whether it be the stock market, whether it be into businesses, whether it be into real estate, whether it be into flipping houses or buying multifamily or buying mobile home parks, whatever it might be that you're interested in, learn as much as you can. So don't be a fool when it, when when you are feel comfortable because people, we're still investing today. A lot of people are still investing right this second. It's because we feel comfortable with what we know about the market. Our knowledge of market indicators is different to say the average joe so we can we can better assess risk and so mm-hmm. what does that mean well that average joe just needs to i start learning more about what we're seeing what we how we're valuing things and so those people who are sitting on the sidelines become more comfortable with what the environment you are in today in order to make the right investments uh, decisions in the future awesome great advice reed great advice and i'll put those contact details on your website on the show notes um i let you get back to your busy job man but i really appreciate the time you've given us and your listeners and i'll look forward to talking to you again soon thanks mate so there you go guys that was show number seven with reed goosens Uh, he's got such a fantastic story i think he should be an inspiration to everybody not just expats like myself that move from overseas to america to chase the american dream and then make money in real estate but if, if he can do it arriving here with no money no contacts you know, nothing and, and build literally a, a small real estate empire. I think any American can do it. We're in the best country in the world to invest in real estate. You're in the best country in the world to achieve financial freedom, to build passive income streams, literally all the tools that you need, whether it's the private financing, the REA meetings, the fixed interest rates, the, the ability to borrow multiple mortgages over 30 years. Everything that you need is here. All the information you need, the infrastructure is here. It's such a sophisticated market that can reward hard work. You don't need to have a special family connection to to be in the know. You can invest in in residential, in commercial, in multifamily, in in syndicates, in loan notes. It's, It's just a great place to be. And I just thought this show and this interview really just highlighted that very well it was it was a great story and you know despite the uncertainty we're in despite this pandemic and all the uncertainty it has about you know the short-term future of real estate prices i think the medium and long term is 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 rock solid and there is no excuse like reed said for not continuing your education for not studying in real estate for not planning and goal setting and if there's anything i can do to help you with that just let me know you've got all my contact information in the show notes my website is colininvestments.com. You'll find me on social media with Colin Investments on Facebook and Twitter. I'm on Instagram and YouTube on Colin G. Murphy. And I'm also including Reed's information here. He's got his own website, his own podcasts, his own books. They're worth checking out. So but that's it. Thanks very much for all your support. Um, I'm really endo- enjoying doing this new show. I hope you are too. And I look forward to talking to you again soon with show number eight. So this is Colin Murphy signing out.